it is <clears throat> unusual for an 89-year-old man to say <clears throat> that I wish my parents could be here. They would be more proud of this distinction than any of the other honors that have come my way. I have had the privilege to serve as Secretary of State of a country that gave my family refuge when the Nazis dominated Germany. And for all of us who have lived through this, we know the dangers of hatred and of discrimination in this world. It was my good fortune to be able to contribute a little bit to the problem of peace and to the security of a country which did not exist when I was a boy. <clears throat> the task of any leadership is to take its people from where it is to where it has never been. And the leaders of Israel through these decades have accomplished a great deal. I met Shimon in 1962 on my first visit to Israel. It was then Jerusalem was then divided. Outposts from the Arab countries were on the road that led from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And so I have had the opportunity to see the achievements and also the wars that have been fought. And now <clears throat> you have honored me at a moment when the world is again in great turmoil. I was asked on television what the moment is that I remember most in my public life. And it was when I was in Aswan during a shuttle. And somebody brought a paper to President Sadat, one of the great men of this time. And he got up, walked over to me, and kissed me on both cheeks and said they have just signed the disengagement agreement at kilometer 101. I will take off my uniform tonight and I will never wear it again except on ceremonial 
occasions. Of course, one of these ceremonial occasions cost him his life. When one has seen these decades, and when one looks at history, one realizes that in order to have peace, there must be two elements. One, there must be justice. That is, the people concerned must feel that they are living in a world that meets their essential needs. And there has to be equilibrium so that the strong cannot dominate the weak. That is our challenge today. And it is at a strange moment because we find that the nation state on which the European and international politics have been based is in the process of disintegrating in many parts of the world. We see that new countries are emerging. We have to deal with an emerging superpower in China, which has a different perception of history and a different perspective of the future than the one to which we are used. We have to deal with a Russia that used to be an imperial power and now finds itself with insecure borders on all sides. And we deal with the Middle East that is in the midst of uprisings. It is the essence of all the revolutions that they begin with resentments and that they then have to find a positive direction in which to evolve. And this is the case of all the countries that are now bordering Israel. So Israel is in many respects an island of stability and of domestic cohesion at a moment of upheaval everywhere else, although you could not necessarily prove that from debates sometimes going on in the Knesset. <clears throat> so in, in, the, in this world, how does one achieve both justice and equilibrium. There are now negotiations going on <coughs> about the military nuclear program in Iran. And the question is, at what point one concludes that negotiations have reached their limit. It is not a question that need, should be answered unilaterally. The fact is that 
the members of the Security Council have stated for 10 years that a military nuclear program in Iran is unacceptable. They owe themselves the need for diplomacy. But also a point must be, will be reached at which they have to define what they mean by unacceptable and how that should be implemented. And that is a moment that will be approached in the months ahead. And it is something that we should all do together. And then there is the problem of a larger peace in the region. There have been many discussions and the outlines of the objective have been frequently put forward. But there has to be one quid pro quo on the other side. It's a peculiarity of the Arab-Israeli negotiations that one side considers recognition of another state as the it's, it's, it's sufficient for the formation of peace. But the recognition of a state is the beginning of peace. It is not the end of peace. Everybody knows the sacrifices that Israel has made and is prepared to make for peace. But the other side has to give some content to what a peaceful world would look like. <clears throat> In this world that we now face, where the governance of societies has become itself a fundamental challenge. There is an opportunity to distill out of these seemingly chaotic conditions a new vision of peace. There are problems in this world that cannot be solved on a national basis anymore. And we know them. Proliferation, energy, environment. We see before us a potential change in energy markets, which will require a rethinking of many relationships. So in all of this, those in this room and their friends around the world, and especially their friends in America, can see many dangers, but they also can see a great opportunity. This country was a dream before it became a reality. And its reality resided in its vision. And so now we face a new period. We are working together. We can work on a world in which the 
weak can be secure and the just can be free. And I want to say again how moved I am that my old friend with whom I went through so many crises, Shimon Peres, gave me this award. And I think also of so many other friends, like Yitzhak Rabin. Golda and Moshe Dayan and the Gal alone, but I would be here all night if I mentioned all my friends. But there was a very poignant moment when Rabin was Prime Minister, when he had had to go to visit a woman whose husband had been killed on the last day of the 1973 war. And this was when Rabin was prime minister in the 90s. And after the Oslo Agreement, and her son was in the special forces and he had extended his stay. And then on a mission to rescue a kidnapped girl, he was killed after his service was already over. And I called Yitzhak and I said that in the end, that all of this will serve a cause in which you will at last bring peace. But Yitzhak was not a word of man of many words. He said, we shall see. And that's our task now, to finish this effort and to fulfill the vision. Thank you very much.